Welcome to the Addiction Solution Podcast. I'm Michelle Dunbar. Enjoy listening and watching as addiction experts Mark Sheeran and I cover controversial as well as helpful topics on addiction, how to move past it, and other related subjects. As two of the co-founders of the Freedom Model, Mark and I will give you a completely new perspective on the topics that matter to you. We will take to task the Recovery Society's lies and misinformation and replace them with facts, research, and the methods to move on from addiction struggles without 12-step meetings, rehabs, and the shackles of endless recovery. Let's escape the treatment and recovery trap together and learn to be free. Welcome to the truth. It's time for you and those you love to step off the addiction roller coaster for good and learn a solution that works. It's called Move Past Addiction Masterclass, and it's a free one hour live online class where you'll hear new and empowering information about how to solve addiction for good without steps, meetings, rehabs, or being labeled for life. If you're struggling or you love someone who is, then this masterclass is for you. To enroll in this free one-hour class, click the link provided or go to thefreedommodel.org and choose the date and time that works for you. See you at the masterclass. Hi, and welcome to the Addiction Solution. I'm Michelle Dunbar. And I'm Mark Sheeran. And we wrote with Stephen Slade, our colleague, the Freedom Model for Addictions, Escape the Treatment and Recovery Trap, and... And the Freedom Model for the Family. And we are actually right now working on the second edition of that book, which we are planning to get out by the end of this year. Um, and uh, yeah, this is uh, this is episode 206. Yeah. And we are, we are on our way into 2024. And... Um, we want to remind you that we have a free one hour live masterclass that can show you exactly how you can move past addiction. And um, right there is the QR code. If you're on a PC, you can hit that with your phone. It's right there. I'm pointing to it. And we have exciting news. We have our app is available. If you go into the app store, whether you're in Google or Apple, um, you can, and you're searching on the freedom model, it's not indexed right away, but if you go into new yeah, apps. Yeah. So at the top there's, I had to look for it. There's a, a thing in the Google store that says new on top over in the right hand corner. Yep. New apps. Um, and, and you'll find us. Yeah. The then you just, app. then you just do the, the search within the new, uh, for the free model that comes up number now, one. Now, if you already have a membership, you've already been to the master class. Right now we're working on it. For some reason, you can't see the, the free content that's in there because you already <laughs> enrolled. Um, if you're brand new to the Freedom Model, there's a bunch of free content in there, including our books. And um, Yeah, so you get the books for free. Yep. You get some lessons for free. You, you get, get a couple chapters of the audiobook for free. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of free content in there for you. Basically what we tried to do is we tried to make it so that anybody that's new to the freedom model can get a sampling of every, all the courses and all the different things that we offer. Yeah. Yep. And you get, you get quick and easy access. If you're already an online program member or you already have been to a master class, you'll get easy access to see the replay of the master class or to get into and do your online program. It's very mobile friendly. There's so. also um, one of the samples is a, a recording of one of the Q&A sessions as an example. Yeah. So. Yep. I think it was from last August. Yeah. So. All right. So there's that. And then, of course, we have uh, the 12 step deprogramming course now is standalone. Yeah, so it. you do not have to get the online program to get that. But if you decide to get the online program, it is included in there. So you don't have to buy both. That's right. So. And of course, we have coaching and the complete addiction solution program as well. And Which uh, if you want to work with us directly, yeah. and you want to learn the entire curriculum in two days with us. We can take you through the whole thing in two days and personalize it to you, your specific uh, substance using style. Um, we've, we've heard it all. We've been doing this for 34 years. We're really, really good at it. Yeah. At yeah. helping people solve the problem for good. So we'd love to help you. We would. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, I, 
I've had a lot of, it, it, in the first couple of weeks here of January, I've had a lot of conversations with new people who I've never talked to before. And I talk with a lot of the women. Um, and, you know, what I'm hearing, I hear a lot of people going to therapy, trying to leave the 12-step program because those are the people that call us. And, um, and they're kind of going down this route of, I just need therapy. I need a lot of therapy. Um, I actually talked to somebody that has, that's going to see three different therapists, um, to deal with trauma and, um, and some of these other issues that they feel like they have. And, and, and I, I said, Mark and I had a conversation about it. When is therapy counterproductive. Yeah. That's what we're going to talk about today. And when is it productive? Right. And, and cause my, my comment um, to this person was at some point, you know, ruminating on the past becomes counterproductive. And, and the, you know, if you're going to therapy, I guess I'm going to say this and then we'll, and then I'll let Mark give his thoughts. If you're going to therapy, and you're getting diagnoses and you're feeling as if, oh, I'm broken and, and you're just talking about the problems over and over and over again, that doesn't seem productive to me. Right. Yeah. It's not productive. And, and you should probably find another therapist if, if you're consistently talking about the problem without a solution. Um, what that tells me is the therapist is incompetent. Yeah, because they don't they obviously don't understand how to help you get through that. Now, um, here's an interesting thought for everybody. What did people do before psychoanalysis, before Freud, before um, the the people that started this idea of of psychoanalysis of any kind, right? It's, it's been the last two hundred years that this has come on the scene. So what was before that? How did people solve problems before that? Well, they did it through uh, religion. They did it, and some of that wasn't very productive, right? Right, well, right. And, and some of it was. Right. And, but they did it through mainly philosophy. Yes. And um, I've been studying the Stoics. That's one philosophy, and there's many philosophies. And many um, religions mm -hmm. in the Far East, for instance, are more philosophy than they are religion, right? So there's mixes of that as well. And then there's then there's people, the majority of people had neither. They uh, they simply moved forward in their life and figured things out, some effective, and some people didn't find solutions to their problems because maybe they just didn't have the skill set or they were in an environment where it wasn't conducive to figure things out and they stayed the same and struggled in life. Some people commit suicide, right? There, we can't deny the fact that people, some people's struggles are so bad and, and that they get to a place where they don't see a solution. So, so here's my point. There's all sorts of various paths to figuring out how to be happier human beings. Um, the one thing we know from the freedom model is that you have the positive drive principle. So you already have, and you have autonomy and free will. So you already have the things that the baking ingredients and you were born with them to be able to problem solve your issues. Now I know that because as a child, I personally experienced going to therapy, but also long periods where I didn't. And I had enormous challenges as a child, massive abuse, neglect, all kinds of really horrible things were happening to me. And I had very little control over my life. And it would have been nice to have a really nice therapist, but I never had a really good one. <laughs> um, but what I realized is that I could, uh, with my autonomy, my free will, my positive drive principle, I could eke out happiness and figure and navigate my way through all that abuse and come out the other side okay. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. I don't want to commandeer the whole conversation, but but I I think we want to start with what is bad therapy, you know, and then go from there. Yeah, I I think there's a there's an idea in modern our modern culture. I think I think where therapy has gone. I, it, first of all. I don't want to paint a broad picture that all therapy is bad because I experienced good therapy um, and which made all the difference. Yeah, that's and a good so point. when, good when point. I tell people, maybe you should seek a therapist, I, I always preface it by saying cognitive behavioral therapy, 
uh, that's a buzzword. And a lot of therapists say, yeah, I do that. But there are, there, but there, if, if somebody has a bunch of different modalities and cognitive behavioral therapy is just kind of thrown in there, I'm, I'm not sure that'd be the right therapist um, because some of the modalities are counter to each other. Um, and, but I would say if you have somebody that says cognitive behavioral and solution focused, where the goal of therapy should be that I don't have to go to therapy anymore. It's kind of like the same thing with addiction, right? It, it's a temporary problem that can be solved and people move on. That's by and large how people do it. The same thing happens with emotional problems as well is isn't the goal to be i'm going to i'm going to learn how to think differently about these problems i'm experiencing how to frame things differently so that i can move on with my life so i think the first thing about therapy is if the goal isn't for me to figure out how to solve these problems so that i can move on well then you're probably not with the right therapist that's probably bad therapy Yes. Yeah, and I think the other the other type of uh, therapy that is counterproductive is when you have a therapist that's a pill pusher, right? Oh, yeah. Where within ten minutes they're writing a script. Well, you're and, broken. Yeah, you're broken, and they write a script because they have no that, and that's very common now. Yeah, um, now it's that's become the norm. A, it, it's become the an arm of the pharmaceutical industry. So if that if if that's what you're experiencing, I would run the other direction. I'm not saying that medications are bad or whatever. No. that's that's not my point. I I have my own opinions about that that I'll keep to myself. But but if I, you spend 20 minutes with somebody and their answer is I'm going to write you a script, that's exactly that's exactly correct. It's it's that's simply wrong. And, and you should, you should not deal with that person. Um, the question is, you know, if there was no therapy, how did people get past their problems specifically? And if we look at human behavior, what happens is as we move through time, we're experiencing new things and our positive drive is going to constantly seek out a happier existence. Now, whether we get that happier existence is pretty much up to us and some circumstance, right? And and so as we navigate forward in our lives, the scripts or the ideas, the beliefs of the past may color our walking forward. So yeah. imagine that you're moving through time, you're experiencing new things, you want your life to get better. Everybody does. And, and then something, quote unquote, triggers you. Something hits you and you react really unfavorably to that situation. Let's say that you're out on a date with a guy and uh, all of a sudden something happens at the restaurant that, and it gets a little dicey. Maybe it gets a little loud and suddenly you're really super uncomfortable. Now, you have no reason to be really super uncomfortable rationally because this event is not a big deal, whatever it might be. Maybe some, maybe the waiter dumped something all over him and, and he freaked out, right? Uh, rationally, you say, well, that's a, that's a rational reaction. But yet, you have this visceral reaction. Mm. You're instantly turned off. Um, you're shaking. And so we could say you were triggered. I don't like that term because it sounds like it's, yeah, you well, can't it's change it. Well, it's an automatic response based on your history. Yeah. So, so you have this reaction and it, and it, and you have two sides in your mind. One is rational going, this is crazy. I don't need to be reacting this way. The other one is I can't stop this reaction. Mm. Now, how did people deal with that? Would they go to in the, in the past, let's say a thousand years ago, would they go to a therapist? No, they didn't exist. Would they go to their shaman? Maybe, you know, would they go to the priest? Yep. Sometimes, but most of the time, because there, there was no accessibility, uh, to, to find these people. Usually what they would do is they would learn and go, wait a minute. I, maybe I don't need to react this way. And then they would lessen that reaction as those types of situations would happen and they'd work through it. But most of all, they were forced to move forward because life in those days was so difficult. If you didn't move forward, if you stayed in the same static circumstances, if you didn't get up and work very hard, it, regardless of how you felt, you would die. Mm -hmm. You would simply die from lack of food and water and the very essentials of life. So, what we see is that in primitive culture, there wasn't a need for therapists because people solved their problems themselves and because they had to, and I had to, 
I had very few resources of help through my youth. So I had a very third world experience. And only when I went, to, when I finally did go to therapy, it was bad therapy and I ran away from it, thankfully, because I avoided the whole pharmaceutical thing. Me too. And I was able to navigate much like a third world person would have in a very primitive culture because I was forced because where I came from to deal with my issues myself. Now, I'm not going to say that that's an easy linear path. It was filled with pain. It was filled with confusion. And eventually I found people that were smarter than me, much like a therapist, but really just a friend. And it was Michelle's father mm -hmm. who helped me walk out of that along with me figuring out a lot of things, which made me a very capable person. I tell that story only because my example is a weird one where I really did live a third world experience in America in this way. And I'm glad I did because I ended up avoiding the mental health system, getting trapped in it, like I see so many people do. I avoided a lot of the therapy, although I was pushed into therapy many times, I, I would reject it. And I would figure things out on my own. And I think Michelle did the same. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, you know, one of the things that I, I learned is what if, and, and, and mind you, I went to like undergraduate school for this. I, I went to college for mental health and behavioral health. And, and there were kind of the main school of thought when you're going to school for this is the, what I call the broken system. It, it is you're broken. You have, I mean, I had you know, different diagnoses mental health wise throughout my childhood and young adulthood. So, um, so there was this idea that there was something skewed in my brain and that there were experiences that I had in my past that were traumatic, that were bad and that broke me. So there's that system where it's that kind of fixed brain idea that, oh, it's broken and it's done. Right. Or, or what if you looked at it like, hmm, no, these experiences that I had were part of the normal human condition, right? Because, yeah. because people, it's part of life. Experiencing trauma is part of life. Yeah. Pain, um, is, part pain of life. is part of mm -hmm. life. Right. And, and so there, that's all normal. And then my responses to them are normal because because people have a wide range of characteristics and perceptions and emotions. And, and so, so when I say I had a good therapy experience, it was the idea that, I mean, it was almost like I rejected all of what I learned in college when I met with this person and she said, no, everything you're talking about is normal, which is basically what, what Mark experienced with my father. Yeah. Like, what if you looked at this, like you're not bipolar, right? Um, you're, you have a, it may be a wider range of emotional makeup than the average person, whatever that means. Um, and and maybe that's okay. Yeah, maybe that's just who you are. Yeah. Let me, let me jump in here. Cause it's so important. I, ever since I was a little boy, I never felt like I fit in the world. Mm. And frankly, yep. I didn't. Yeah. I, I, I didn't, I wasn't like other, a lot of other kids that could socialize. Well, I didn't have those skill sets. So I was ripe for the picking for the treatment industry and for, uh, the, the ther therapeutic community to manipulate me into thinking there was something wrong with me. And I can remember going to this lady, Jean, she was a counselor when I was 15. And I had, I wrote a letter to my mother saying I was suicidal. And, and I was, I was, I was having a very hard time in life. <laughs> I was 16. My mother found my death poems, but go yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was in a pretty uh, desperate place and really unhappy and lonely, terribly lonely. And, and so Jean was a, she was a decent human being, but immediately she started to diagnose me. And, oh. and I just, I just immediately felt like this, this isn't right. right. I don't, God, I don't, it's so I, good that you I, thought that. Yeah. I just did. I was like, no, no, I, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't resonate. I'm more fearful now. So one of the things that I think is really important is shedding labels. Diagnoses will make people feel better 
for a very short period of time because it builds a framework of why why I'm screwed like up. Like an explanation. Right. Yes. Oh, yes. it's yeah. Now, the explanation for most things, I'm not going to say that there aren't disorders. I don't I don't know enough about it to say that. Okay. I'm not a psychiatrist. That's not my training. Um, but here's what I know working with tens of thousands of people with all kinds of very serious problems, uh, me included, right? Um, when you get rid of the labels, what you find is that they're people that are scared and hurt. Mm. They're people that are scared and hurt and love, listening, and then solving primary problems gets them well on their way to a mental fitness that's better. And what I mean by a primary problem is, let's say that they're depressed, anxious, and uh, frightened most of the time, have a lack of confidence, low self-esteem, and have a, a massive heroin problem or a drinking issue. Well, I take care of the primary issue, which is drinking, because you can't think straight to problem solve if you're fucked up. <laughs> right, right, I, right. So, right. so, so that's what this is about. That's what yes. the freedom model is about. So, we're not taking the place of therapy. We're not taking the place of trying to tell you how to move on with your life. We're not taking the place of anything. What we're doing is taking care of a primary problem. You have to decide what your primary problem is. And then being depressed, being anxious, having low self esteem, having a lack of confidence, and generally having social problems are inherently human things. I've discovered that yes. everybody has them. Everybody. Everybody. And and it doesn't matter who they are. They have sexual issues. They have confidence issues. They have fears. They have deep-seated anxieties and some, to one degree or another. Labeling it and then acting like we know that your brain is controlling all of this and your biochemistry, that's just, I have enough training to know that that's just bunk, right. okay? Your biochemistry doesn't run your thoughts. The way you frame your world and your social engagements and in your private life and your beliefs are what frame how you feel. And there's lots of research on that. This isn't me just talking out my ass. Yep. So, so it's, the question is then, if you have all of these things, I think the first thing we need to do as human beings is go, wait a minute, let me let go of the labels for a minute and realize that considering where I came from, considering my beliefs about people and the world around me, I have a certain view of the world that is either negative or positive and comes out with either negative or positive outcomes. And mine just happened to come out with negative outcomes. Maybe I can change the way I see the world. Let me find somebody that has a better view of the world. <laughs> may not be a therapist. That's right. Suddenly you may find a mentor. Jer wasn't a therapist. He was a business mentor who changed my life and a researcher. And ironically, he knew more than every therapist I had ever gone to. I was pushed into therapy a lot of different times. I rejected all of it because they didn't resonate with me. It didn't, right. I kept feeling worse. So that's the litmus test. If it you keep, is. if you keep feeling worse or it's not getting better, it's not working. And that, that includes medications that includes psychodrama, psychotherapy, CBT, and all the different acronyms that are out there now. Yeah. I mean, you can see that even with the, the, the addiction world and all the different, you know, meetings and support groups and things like that. You may feel better. If you feel better, this is such a great point Mark made for just a very short period of time. And then you find yourself back in that same place feeling like shit. Well, then it's not working. You know, we, we, I hear people say, um, well, AA worked for me for like five years. It was great. It was great. And then, and then I just, I just felt terrible. It was awful. And it's like, well, it, it, do you still feel like you're an alcoholic? Well, then it didn't work. It didn't work. You know, if, if your idea of working is I'm going to temporarily, I'm going to have that daily reprieve from this, this alcohol problem, then you're not solving the problem. You're kicking the can down the road. Right. That's, yeah. that's what you're doing. And so with mental health as well. Now I, I want to qualify something. And I thought about this when we were, when Mark was talking and that is, yes, there are mental 
diseases, so to speak, yeah. mm -hmm. schizophrenia and those disorders. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I agree. That we're not talking about those things. That's right. Okay. That's right. Because that's a teeny tiny percent of the population that is, I, I did study some of this. There are schools of thought that are kind of way out there that I've studied as well that say, mm, even those things are, uh, we don't really know a lot about them. The truth of the matter is even the mental health community doesn't know a lot about them. Um, but we're not talking about those things. I'm talking about the bulk of emotional disorders that people are diagnosed with. Yeah. So what we're talking about is the common man or woman in, in the world who depression, anxiety, yeah, is struggling with an extreme version of an emotion. Yes. You know, whether it's ma mania, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, those are the three biggies, right? Yeah. If, if you have an extreme version of that in your life that's because you frame circumstances a certain way. Does your biochemistry play a role? Of course, your body plays a role in everything, but it's the recipient of your ideas. Yes, yeah, it's it, it's post thought. Right. Right? Like like you have a it reacts to thought. Yes, yes, your your brain is a slave to your mind. That's right. Okay. Not, not the, not other, the way. other way around. That's right. And yeah. Yeah, so you can change uh, a thought by changing your mind. Right. I mean, that's that's how we do that. So by reframing something with a new perspective and then the emotion changes as a result. And that's a hard concept if you're taught the opposite, that your brain chemistry is driving you God. and you need medications as your answer to your mental problems. Now, people often say, so you're anti-medication. I said, no, I, I've taken medications, not for mental health, but for many things in my body. Um, but I can say that if it's a tool and and you feel it works for you, take it. I have no opinion on that. None. That, that It doesn't matter to me. But here's what I know. Reframing your life with new information and new ways to look at things will change your life. It always will. In both ways, negative and positive. If you have a reframing of a situation into a negative perspective, I guarantee you that will increase anxiety and will, will cause all kinds, kinds of problems. Um, the opposite is true. It, but the beauty of your mind is that it's limitless with free will. So you get to frame things however you want. And that's the whole point of philosophy, of stoicism, as an example. Reframe your mind, reframe your life. So yeah, ultimately, good therapy will help you realize how much control you have over your life yeah. and your thoughts and your emotional world. Okay. Good therapy shows you that. And, and bad therapy will make you feel more powerless. That's right. They will label first, they will medicate second, and then they will keep you in the therapy forever third. That is the defining characteristics of really bad therapy. Yeah. Unless of course you have a serious mental illness. I, again, have no uh, expertise on schizophrenia. I know quite a bit about it because we, of what uh, I we do have for worked living, with people actually, but, but I'm not going to sit here on a podcast and go blathering on. Like, I know what I'm talking about when it comes to schizophrenia. I don't. So, uh, but, but in the normal range of human emotion and even extreme, I have boatloads of experience, both personally and professionally. Yeah. And I can tell you that most human beings are just scared. They're just scared and, and they don't like being vulnerable for a myriad of reasons. And, uh, and we are anxious because of that and for many different reasons, but we can reframe these situations. I do it with people every day and, uh, and they change and they find happiness in a world that's filled with all kinds of pitfalls. The other thing is there's a certain level of accepting the uncomfortable. Mm. So, so I bought a Harley two years ago and, and I started riding. And when you're young riding a motorcycle, you could give a shit less. I remember riding my motorcycle at night in the dead of winter. Um, and I would ride and then take my hand and put it down on the engine cases where it's hot and warm up my hand and then switch. And I'd have the throttle with my left hand. I'd be riding with one hand and he heat, was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Heat the other <laughs> hand. So, and, and then I would slow down and then use the engine heat to heat my body and then keep going. And and then I turned 50 and I got a Harley and I was just uncomfortable with the bar position. You know, I, he was. I, was, I was just like, this is He's like, he kept like tweaking things. Yeah. I was like, Jesus, you know, <laughs> make it more comfortable. And then I read an article that helped me. 
<laughs> reframe the situation. And they said, when you get a motorcycle in middle age and past middle age, um, you're going to suddenly realize that you have to embrace being relatively uncomfortable. And it doesn't matter if you're on a Honda Goldwing or if you're on a Harley or a dirt bike. It's the nature. It's part of the charm of the motorcycle. It's the visceral experience. So suddenly, <laughs> suddenly I was comfortable. I didn't change the bars I didn't change the seat. And suddenly I, I accepted that I had a backache and that my butt hurt <laughs> and that I was cold sometimes. And, and I, I suddenly I got it. I figured it out. Right. Well, when you do that with life, you know, we're teaching all these young people that, that, that their feelings matter and to ah. an extreme and that they need to be comfortable and they need to just be given self-esteem. This is bullshit. You have to, you have to embrace being uncomfortable in the world, folks, or you're never going to survive it because the world is a tough place. Well, it's, it's kind of like telling somebody, you know, you need to, you need to get a career that you're passionate about and you need to have purpose and you need to have all these things. Look, at, there is not a career in the world. I, I'm absolutely passionate about what we do. I love what I do. Um, are there things and aspects to what we do that I don't like? Absolutely. Yeah. 80% of it's work. It, it's work. Any job, any career you get is work. And so for a for the beginning of my my early career, my early life, I got my first job when I was like 12 years old. Um, you know, I was I was working on a farm. I was picking berries, uh, berries and beans and um at 12 years old and I'd ride my bike down there and and there was nothing about it I liked. Nothing. Yeah, um <laughs> but at the end of the week and it was piecework. So we would get a, a like 20 cents a quart for the strawberries. So you had to pick a lot of damn strawberries <laughs> to make yeah. any money. Yeah. But I can remember getting like the end of the week, getting like in cash, like 28 bucks. Right. Yeah. I was not a very fast picker. <laughs> and, um, and then getting that and like sticking in my pocket and riding home, yeah. you know, I mean, I learned so much. I think the year after that, I think I picked for two years. And then the year after that I was painting. My dad got me a job painting for a guy that owned the building that he had an office in. So all summer I painted rooms, like, like just like roller brushes, painted rooms, which I hated to this day. I hate that. But do I, you know, do I, but I liked the money at the end of the, you know, I mean, so there's all these different things in, and then you you decide you make the best of the things that are make you uncomfortable or that you don't enjoy um, so that you can get the benefits that you do enjoy. Yeah. So I, I don't want this to be confused with if you're in a really bad, depressed state. Right. I, and and we're saying, you know, just pick yourself up with your bootstraps. That's no, not, that's not what that, we're saying. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that. When you're, when you're living your life, sometimes you have to look at the bigger picture. Yeah. You have to expand because the nature of depression is that you're myopic and lost in a moment and a, and a place. And your world feels very small, yeah, very you, limited. You make it small and limited, and then you focus on the limited and you focus on the negative. And sometimes what you have to do is just to break out of that is, is take a couple of steps forward. Now, here's an interesting thing about the positive drive principle and time. The human psyche is designed to expand, to learn. Every part of your physiology, your body is uh, the only machine in the universe that the more you use it, the better it gets. Mm, that's true. Right? So we're designed for action. We are not designed for being static, both mm. in the mind or in the body. The more static and sedentary you become in the mind and the body, the more fixed mindset you have, I guarantee the more unhappy you, you will become. Now, that's not to say that you have to go out and be, you know, Einstein or, or whoever. Um, the point is that you take steps forward. Your past will build context into how you see that present moment. Mm. So every present moment, your past context is playing a role. Then the question is, identify what from your past has been making the present difficult and let go of it. Yeah. If you have a, a script in your head that every time you go out, you say, I'm not beautiful because your mother said you were ugly in that dress hmm. when you were five or 10, or maybe she said it every day, right? Um, 
then you the context will be every time you leave, you'll think that. But you don't have to. No. What you can do is you can say, you know what? Today I feel pretty. Yesterday, not so much. Maybe tomorrow I'll feel bad again. But right now, I'm going to decide to feel pretty. And I've talked to people about this all the time, that sometimes we have to we have to create our own self-image, our own world of what we want to become. Now, there's there's certain circumstances in life that land in our lap. There's chronic diseases. There's um, going bankrupt by some unfortunate circumstances, getting a divorce out of the blue, found out our spouse, spouse is cheating or something. These things are going to happen to us. That's me on the Harley being really uncomfortable. There's the uncomfortability of life that lands in your lap. And some of it is stinging and painful. But then the question is, how do I deal? Am I going right. to deal with it the same way I used to? Or am I going to forge forward with my positive drive, find a happier existence and find somebody that cares about me? Find somebody that tells me I'm beautiful in the dress. Find some other circumstance that makes me feel better about myself and reject the labels of the past. That's what we're talking about here. Now, if a therapist makes that happen with you, if that's the sort of thing that they're saying, renew yourself that you have the control within your mind, well, then I guarantee you that's positive psychiatry or psychology. It's going to change your life because they're in that boat with you rowing and they're saying, hey, we know it's uncomfortable. There's nothing deeply wrong with you. Yes. You might be screwed up today. And trust me, man, I was, I've had suicide attempts. I've been in dark, dark places, but I've also climbed the mountain, let go of that shit moved away from my hometown, never looked back. Yeah, That's what I had to do to find myself and build myself. And I let go of any self-image that was detrimental, addict, mentally ill, depressive, lonely. And I just went out and I started meeting people and just tried. Yeah. But it was, but it was a marathon, right? Yeah. So better is better and let go of the scripts of the past if you can. And if you have a therapist that's willing to work with you to do that, that's good psychology. It is. It is. It, it, my life changed dramatically when I stopped thinking of myself as broken. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, so a good therapist is going to let you know that you're not broken and that you have the absolute ability to be happy you know, to yeah. find happiness in your life because anybody and everybody can find happiness as long as they're given the right information and, and some, and for you, it's going to be different than it is for somebody else. That's right. You know, I mean, you can, a lot of people have opinions and they're like, oh, you need daily exercise and you should take a multivitamin and blah, blah, blah. everybody has their ideas, but for you, it's going to be what it is for you and it's fine. It's fine. So any therapist, um, good therapist will work with you to, to help you to move forward in your life, to reframe things and to find what makes you happy. That's right. That's right. That's a perfect place to end. Okay. All right. Remember, uh, we have our master class. So go to the QR code over there um, and click on it and you can register or go to the freedommodel.org. It's right on the front page. Actually, if you go to the freedommodel.org, it has all of our information. Um, you can get our books for free. Um, if you go to the app, you download the app, you can get our books for free. Um, so, and also if you're in the freedom model online program already, you're going to find, if you get the app that navigating is a lot easier on your mobile phone. And that's one of the big benefits of why we did it. We yeah. wanted it to be more professional, easier to navigate, especially on a mobile device. Cause people are, we found that people are using it a lot more than on the PC. Um, and then an, another thing is, uh, if you need more help, if you need somebody to talk to, give us a call 88. 888-424-2626. We have literally had that, that, that 800 number for 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> somehow, eight, eight, and eight. somehow I forgot it for a minute. 888-424-2626. All right. All right. Everybody. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Are you struggling with a drug or alcohol problem, but you don't want to go to rehab or group meetings? 
That's why we created the non 12 step freedom model coaching program in 2011. Through video conferencing on zoom or Skype, you can work privately with a certified freedom model coach from your home or office on your schedule. And here's the best part. With the Freedom Model, you'll never be labeled an addict or an alcoholic, and we won't tell you to go to 12-step meetings or hamper your life with endless recovery rituals. Instead, you can learn exactly why addiction isn't a disease and how you can solve the problem for good and move on with your life. Do you want to be completely free from your addiction? Do you want to never have to attend meetings, rehabs, or addiction counseling ever again? And do you want to solve your problem from the comfort of home? Then call us at 888-424-2626 to talk with a Freedom Model coach today and experience the Freedom Model difference.